Okay. Okay, hello, welcome to Idea to IPO, our host today for startups in a down economy. Uh, Idea to IPO, as you know, is the most prolific startup organization in Silicon Valley and probably the world. It's been around for 12 years now, I believe. So if we were live, we would all clap at this point <clears throat> because that's a long time in a startup world that's like 12 lifetimes. Uh, so congratulations, ID to IPO, and thank you for hosting this event. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a tax and corporate partner with Haynes Boone. It's an international AMLAW 100 law firm. I'm based in Palo Alto, along with Gabor, who's going to be speaking today. And we do tech startups, emerging growth and venture capital. We do formations, financings, M&A, commercial contracts, and everything in between. And today's topic is going to be a little bit more business focused. We're lawyers. So, you know, we, we talk about the law. Of course, it's an occupational hazard. That's one of our personality defects. We're going to talk about the law. But we are going to talk a lot about just what's going on out in the market and what to expect. And um, uh, what our view is, at least uh, Gabor's uh, and my view, of, of, of what the environment is like today and what depending who you talk to is or is not, or may be a down economy. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit Silicon Valley centric. So I'll warn you, those of you that are from around the world, but uh, keep in mind my experience, pretty much everybody ends up having a presence here at one time in one way or another, eventually. You're either here for talent, for markets or for money. So here's how it's going to go to get today. Uh, the presentation uh, is going to be one hour long, one hour presentation. We'll go to the top of the hour. And then um, Gabor is going to take questions for the next one half hour, and we will close on the dot uh, in an hour and a half. Yes, this is being recorded. It's being recorded. And at the end of this presentation, we are going to email to all of you a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides in PDF format. So if you feel like you missed something, don't sweat it. You'll have an opportunity to review it. Now, this is very important. I know you're gonna have questions and we want you to have questions and we're gonna answer your questions. Uh, don't use the chat feature. It's just too hard to follow. There's too much stuff in it. Use the Q&A dialog box. It's at the bottom of your screen, okay? Q&A dialog box for questions. We'll gather them up. We'll get to them uh, in one hour. Okay, with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, you get a real treat today because you don't have to listen to me for an hour and a half as usual. Today, I've got my colleague, Gabor Sessi. He's an attorney in the Capital Markets and Securities Practice Group at Haynes Boone Palo Alto office. His practice focuses on general corporate law, commercial contracts, and emerging growth companies, mergers, and acquisitions. He also advises venture funds on formation and regulatory compliance. Uh, before joining us, Gabor was an attorney for investment firms uh, and, and incubator programs in the space and defense sector, interestingly, uh, where he gained valuable experience in sector-specific regulatory compliance. So with that, Gabor, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Rajat. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, if you come back for a Q&A, maybe we could form a panel. Um, sorry for that. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Gabor Sechi, and uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you to uh, IDEA for IPO to organizing this uh, event today and for Roger giving me the opportunity to uh, talk um, today about this uh, very interesting topic and very interesting time uh, we have nowadays. So that Today's topic is uh, startups in the down economy. I'm going to talk a little bit about business, financing strategies and, uh, and legal, uh, legal matters uh, in relation to uh, startups and funds. First, a disclaimer, I'm an attorney, but this presentation is uh, not legal advice. I'm going to talk about certain legal issues, but uh, they will be in general terms. The purpose of this presentation is to help you to understand uh, the general legal terms that helps you manage your company, negotiate with the 
venture capitals, but because each case is different, uh, the different cases requires different solutions. So if you have any specific legal problem, please re reach out an attorney with uh, relevant experience. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, a short history of, uh, of recession. This, this uh, recession period now is not the first and probably not, not the last, last. And I'm going to overview, uh, overview what happened uh, in, in the past and uh, what is the history of recession. Maybe we can learn something from it. How, how the funds, new, uh, how the new fund formation uh, work in, in down economy uh, and uh, what was the effect of uh, of the contraction to uh, on startups then i'm going to talk about some uh, uh, contract law uh, if you if you have uh, or startups you have financial trouble how can you uh, avoid performance or what are you what are what are your options the li liability of the management could be very important in these times you have to make uh, difficult decisions. Sometimes the decision not necessarily in the best interest of the uh, shareholders and uh, the managers need to get sued. What can you do? And then I would like to uh, close this uh, today's presentation with some uh, venture capital terms, mostly talking about um, investors protection, investors rights, and how the investors are managing uh, through these times. Um, so we are in interesting times nowadays. And, uh, and uh, I think the first question is, are we in a recession? If you look at the media, you can, uh, you can read um, various uh, articles about it. You can get mixed messages. The New York Times said the economy is improving faster than ever. That's what that's what they said in uh, in February. Berkeley said all systems go. The pharmaceutical technology said that U.S. economy experience is the deepest recession of all times. And uh, the Reuters said still no recession. Um, the, but uh, if if we if we look at the numbers, the GDP grew. 6.9% uh, in, uh, in the last quarter of 2021. And uh, in the first quarter, the US economy uh, contracted 1.6%. Uh, uh, so a negative, uh, we had a GDP growth of uh, negative 1.6%. The uh, second quarter uh, GDP numbers are going to come out next week. I think on uh, July 28th, we will see uh, uh, what they are going to report. We have heard uh, the Atlanta Fed's uh, prognosis uh, two weeks ago. They, uh, they, uh, they predicted uh, another about uh, one, negative 1.5% 1 uh, GDP growth. And the definition of a recession requires two consecutive negative quarters. So if uh, these quarters turn out to be negative, uh, we will be in officially in, uh, in recession, but what does recession exactly mean? Uh, what we can expect, although uh, no recession is the same, but past recession may, may give us some ideas. There were 14 recorded recessions between the Great Depressions in the 1920s and, uh, and today. Each time the depth was different, the length was different. However, there were um, a few com common, uh, common interesting patterns. And uh, in my first section of my presentation, I would like to uh, uh, review these uh, patterns. So this uh, chart here shows the uh, uh, history of recession, these uh, gray shades are the recessionary periods. There are 12 of them uh, between uh, the 40s and uh, 2022. This chart comes from the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. 
Also, it shows the unemployment rate, but I'm not going to talk about this, uh, uh, talk about that this time. Um, at first glance, we can note that most of the uh, recession lasted less than one year. If you, if you, if you look, at, look at it, none of them are, are longer than uh, one year. We have in uh, 1975, a longer period in the 80s. That's actually a, an interesting period that was, uh, it's called a double uh, deep uh, recession when, whenever we, uh, we have an economic uh, problem, economic, economic turn down, uh, people and the media likes to uh, refer to this uh, double deep recession period. And then we had a longer recession period in 2008, that's the, the financial crisis. And we had a very short, uh, downturn in 2020 when the lockdown uh, started. Um, then, what what caused this recession? I think that's uh, that's one of the important question to to, uh, uh, to analyze our our current current economic environment, and uh, if we uh, look at the history in the um, in the 80s uh, after after the war we had a post uh, post war uh, economic recovery the economy started to uh, uh, started to improve there was a, a short boom, uh, boom um, which resulted in a backlog of uh, customer demand um, and a shortage of uh, production capacity and uh, and the custom uh, the government spending was uh, uh, was decreased and uh, and we had a, a surge of inflation and if you if you look at this it's very similar to what we have uh, uh, right now we have the supply uh, supply chain problems we also have uh, some uh, a backlog of uh, consumer demand it takes a lot of time to uh, deliver the goods what you are buying and uh, and we have some shortage of uh, production production capacity as well how uh, in the uh, in the 50s uh, 50 uh, 55 50, 53 that interestingly coincides with the korean war and uh, and again after after the war the industry had to uh, adjust to uh, a uh, peacetime environment, and instead of supplying the uh, uh, army and uh, uh, supporting the uh, uh, troops, it had to uh, shift and uh, and uh, and serve the uh, serve the local industry. The eighties, what I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, is a little bit different. It started in seventy nine with the uh, Iranian revolution. Uh, Iranian revolution caused an energy uh, energy crisis. The uh, oil uh, uh, price went up, causing a, a shock in the in the economy. And then it, uh, it then uh, the economy started to improve and uh, fell back mainly because of the uh, the financial sector. In the eighties, uh, the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act. Uh, phased out a number of restrictions uh, on the, the financial practices, broadened their lending powers, caused irresponsible uh, lending practices, and the banks rushed to uh, rushed into real estate lending, speculative lend lending, and other ventures as the economy uh, economy was uh, soaring. However, by the uh, mid eighty two, uh, about fifty bank. Uh, failed and uh, and about 540 banks had uh, serious financial problems. Uh, they were on, on the verge of failure. After this uh, uh, recessionary period, uh, the financial sector uh, had a very long re recovery period, which uh, ended uh, late 90s, early 80s. In many respects, actually, this period was very similar to what we saw in 2008 to the, in the financial uh, crisis period. Um, 
in 2001, the dot-com crisis was a little bit different. It was a rapid rise in the US uh, technology stocks, uh, equity valuation, the value of markets grew exponentially during this period. The Nasdaq from uh, 1,000 to uh, uh, rose to more than 5,000 between this period. And actually by 2000, it went back close to uh, uh, 1,000. And, um, and this uh, bubble burst at some point. A lot of company failed, burning burning uh, millions of dollars or billions of dollars uh, investors' money. So if we, uh, if we look at these, uh, uh, these recessional periods, we, we can see one interesting pattern. One is that the, the post-war uh, recession periods are, uh, are kind of a, a transitional uh, recession periods. While the, uh, the in the 80s and, and the 2000, the dot com and the financial crisis, uh, recession caused by some uh, structural problem. There was some uh, tr uh, problem in the economy, mostly the uh, the financial sector, that least uh, that uh, led to uh, to a, re a recession. And um, and if if we uh, if we are looking at what happened during the post uh, post war uh, economy, the uh, supply chain problem, the uh, uh, the uh, um, backlogs in costume, consumer demand is very similar to what we have now, and it's very similar to what we had in two thousand and twenty, uh, and and the the reason being is that the economy in a way has to adjust to the new uh, to the new environment. So in the, in the post-war time, the, the, uh, the industry had to uh, support the military and, uh, and then they had to adjust to peace economy. In the COVID the lockdown, we started to uh, uh, do more uh, purchase online and uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't go out, we didn't travel which had uh, an interesting uh, effect on the economy. When it opens up again, then uh, the customer demand and the customer, uh, the customs are, uh, are changing and the economy has to adjust to this change. The government spending usually decreases uh, post-war time because uh, the government doesn't spend too much, uh, as much money on uh, reaching the war. Now we uh, during COVID we had the, uh, the stimulus check, the, uh, the Fed's quantitative easing, repurchase operations, uh, lending lending programs. Some of the lending programs still uh, extended uh, until uh, until the end of this year, but many of them was discontinued. The inflation was high, and interestingly, the uh, unemployment rate uh, were low in both. Uh, periods. Looking at the uh, the, the sectors, um, businesses that are uh, doing well during or the, were, were doing well uh, during uh, lockdown, not accidental that the internet based businesses were doing well during the lockdown. We started to purchase more uh, online. Uh, the communicate you know, online communication uh, communicating uh, sector. Uh, became very popular. Zoom, the telemedicine services started acquiring more customers. The streaming services performed very well. Um, because we have an increased online presence, cybersecurity is more, more important than ever. After, uh, after the last, uh, last year's exceptional performance, however, we have seen uh, the first uh, quarter's reports from these uh, companies, and they showed a slowing performance in these industries. Um, the, uh, the second quarter's reporting period has just started. Um, this week, I think, uh, the uh, banking sector, financial sector reports. Yesterday, the uh, uh, big banks uh, posted their, their reports, and next week is going to uh, going to report Netflix, I think, and we are going to see, start to see uh, the uh, second uh, quarter performance of the uh, internet companies. 
and we will, we will see how uh, they perform. Analysts are expecting a, a, a slowing performance, which actually, uh, pro, actually uh, caused by the uh, new industry and the, and the changes in the, uh, the customer behavior. Businesses that are, did, didn't do well during the economy uh, or during, the, during COVID times is the energy sector. Um, the oil, uh, the oil sector, uh, oil futures and uh, natural gas futures were very interesting during COVID, COVID time. They were among the, the losers. The May 2020 uh, crude future turned into negative uh, on the last trading day. Um, and uh, it was because mostly because of fears. Uh, I, I would say that one of the uh, biggest uh, impact on uh, on the uh, on the economy and especially futures trading is the hopes and fears. And uh, and in 2020, when the lockdown started, uh, the energy uh, consumption and demand energy demand uh, dropped. Then. The producers uh, didn't really know uh, where the economy goes and uh, what's going to happen with the uh, uh, with the demand. And uh, in the in the meantime, the inventory started to increase. The uh, storages uh, uh, reached, uh, reached their uh, uh, capacity limits. And in, in May, basically nobody wanted to uh, take the risk of buying uh, more oil and. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and then they have to spend a lot of money on storage if they can actually store for a long time. It was similar for uh, on the uh, natural gas market. At some point, the uh, natural gas uh, price was close to it was below one dollars, and uh, and we all know what happened now uh, on the on the uh, energy on the oil and natural gas uh, market. It's uh, still at the oil food futures is around uh, one hundred dollars, and um, and not necessarily. It's 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 a very very complex uh, industry. The uh, Ukraine war uh, has an has an effect on it, um, and of course the the European and the American. Uh, um, Approach to uh, to the Ukrainian war with the uh, regulations and uh, and sanctions or have effect on the energy prices, but uh, but this transition transitional period uh, has um, has a big effect too because uh, during the lockdown, uh, the oil producers responded with closing down some rigs. And uh, even though they are increasing production, I just uh, I just looked at the uh, uh, weekly report compared to uh, last year. The the U.S. production increased a lot, but uh, but uh, the storages and the, uh, the stored oil and the inventory is still below average. And I think we can uh, we can see real uh, uh, change in the in the price uh, or the oil price and the natural gas price when the inventory is uh, is reaching the average or above average uh, average level, which takes of course uh, some time, and uh, and uh, and this is the this is the transition transitionary period what uh, what I'm talking about. So the conclusion is that uh, we can. We can say that based on uh, based on the historic data, that uh, it's a transitional recession. The industry needs to needs to adjust, which which takes time. And when it, when it happens, then uh, we can uh, we can uh, see uh, better numbers, better economic performance. The focus may shift to other industry segments. So while the uh, uh, the best performing uh, companies were the internet companies during the during the lockdown period. Maybe their performance will uh, won't be as good as it, it was, and the other industry segments uh, become stronger. The his historically, uh, uh, this transitional period not, uh, are not longer than than one year, and the recovery period is faster. 
So um, hopefully we can we can uh, we can expect a, a milder recession. We we don't have to experience uh, such bad times that we have uh, in 2008. But what does it mean for the venture capital industry? I have uh, some more data. Uh, specifically for the venture capital in, in industry in 2020 was a historical record. You can see, if, if you can see there were uh, uh, over 6,000 deals, the invest, investments reached 130 billion dollars and, um, and the 2021 was even better. 80% of uh, of the one estimated one trillion dollars private equity money went to the smaller companies. The venture back companies uh, aggregate valuation was uh, 45 trillion dollars. And, uh, and based on estimates, still there is a 900 billion dollars dry, uh, dry powder is available as of now. What, what that means that uh, still have uh, about 900 billion dollars in the hand of, hands of the venture capital funds uh, to invest in, uh, in startup companies. Some more numbers, uh, CB Inside 20, 2021 report said that about 621 billion dollars uh, VC money is available globally. Um, and, uh, and uh, half of it is in the US and one third is in, in, in Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley is still uh, the, uh, the center and, uh, and uh, probably the best place for startup companies. Looking at the uh, rest of the financial sector, we can see that the, uh, the stock, stock, stock prices decreased a lot and the publicly traded companies lost a lot of value. This is the uh, NASDAQ historical uh, chart and since November uh, it, uh, it fell about 30 percent. The uh, Dow and the S&P 500 uh, similarly, uh, uh, similarly show about 30 percent uh, loss. And um, some publicly, uh, some publicly traded stocks are down 70, 90% at NASDAQ. It means that the company's share price, some of them were, let's say about $400 in November, now trading around $40. It also means if these companies recover, recover you, can, you can expect uh, 10, 10, 10 times profits so from $40 to four hundred dollars, or but if if the uh, if they won't recover the entire value, then uh, then you can still expect two, three, four x uh, profit, which means that right now we can find uh, strong com uh, strong companies with good fundamentals, promising future. Some of them are uh, income generating companies, trading at great discount at the uh, on the stock exchange. On the other hand, the venture capital investment is uh, extremely risky. Uh, some statistics state that 40% of the on, only 40% of the startups become profitable, which uh, is um, probably a very uh, positive uh, number. Nine out of nine startups out of ten startups uh, fail. 20% of the startups fall apart in the, in the first year. 30% uh, after the second year. Half of the startups uh, close down in five years and 70% of the startups dissolve within 10 years. Now, um, in these circumstances, a re reasonable money manager would consider or, or may stay away from uh, venture capital funds because the, uh, the stock markets offers great opportunities and comparable opportunities at great risks. The uh, National Bureau of Economic uh, Research uh, um, report uh, states that the VC return is an average uh, 700 percent. Now if you if you uh, if you uh, have a good picks on the uh, 
on the stock market on the on the Nasdaq, you can you can actually get probably a comparable uh, companies, and uh, and the stock market is liquid. You can sell the shares if you need money. If you eventually uh, have to realize that you made a bad investment decision, you can mitigate your uh, uh, damage. If if you are a VC investor, you you tie up your mo money and uh, uh, you can simply lose uh, your in entire investment. You, it's an ill illiquid investment. You cannot you cannot get out. Publicly traded companies already have tractions. Many of them, as, as, as I mentioned, many of them are income generating companies. So um, nowadays, probably for many investors, the, uh, the stock market is a better option than, uh, than putting their money in, in new uh, venture capital funds. And uh, this is supported by this, uh, this chart that shows the, uh, the fund counts and capital raised during the financial crisis. This period here uh, shows the uh, dot com and the, and the post dot com uh, pe period. This one shows the uh, two thousand uh, the financial crisis period. And as you can see, in two thousand there were five hundred and eighty five uh, funds, while in two thousand and two it's uh, the fund count was less than half. They raised the funds raised eight, eighty-eight point four billion dollars, and uh, and uh, only two billion dollars was raised in two thousand and and then and two. Um, in two thousand and eight, four hundred and forty-three uh, funds were raised, and uh, fifty fifty-three billion dollars capital were raised by these funds. And it, and it fell to uh, 338 funds. And also, as you can see, the uh, capital raised was a lot less than uh, one year earlier. So uh, the recession definitely has a negative effect on the VC fundraising activity. But uh, another interesting question, how does it, uh, how does it affect the startup investing and and the, and the startup economy. This chart again uh, shows the uh, financial crisis period, and uh, is a VC deal activity by stage, and uh, and and uh, it shows that uh, this uh, blue line, the angel seed count, the late uh, late VC deal count. And uh, and the, the early VCD counted with green. The bars are bars are showing the the deal value. So, uh, interestingly, even if the uh, VC fundraising activity uh, decreased during the recession period, the angel seed deal count uh, actually increased. I would say the later uh, VC deal count remained constant, and uh, and the early VC uh, deal count increased a little bit. The valuation, the deal values also uh, shows a nice increase between 2007 and 2011, although in the 2010 uh, period was a, was a little bit little bit lower, but we, we are not seeing significant, uh, significant drop in, uh, uh, in deal value. So why is it that? And uh, it goes back to the dry powder, what, uh, what I mentioned earlier. The existing funds already have the committed uh, capital from their investors. They still have the money to invest. And, uh, and, uh, and they, they actually have to, they have, they have some pressure to invest their money because, uh, because they don't want to uh, uh, sit the funds, the funds uh, should work. And uh, and it should be in a in a in a good uh, startup companies that eventually generating profits for the fund. And that's why uh, in the, the recessionary pe period doesn't really uh, show any uh, negative impact on uh, on the startup deals. 
and the startup deal activity. If the fundraising difficulties that uh, uh, occurs during the recessionary period have some effect, then probably uh, it comes uh, a little bit later, uh, maybe five or five or six months later. However, if um, uh, if the um, if if the uh, if the recessional period is mild, shallow, and uh, and short, then probably the VC fundraising activity uh, accelerates and it can balances out uh, balances out the uh, the more difficult period, and uh, we don't see uh, a huge impact on uh, on the VC deal activity and uh, at the at the startup level. Uh, turning to uh, a second section of the uh, of the presentation, now we can we can uh, take a look at the uh, the business side, the startup side of the uh, uh, of the uh, um, issues during the down economy. In down economy, the company has uh, probably less income. It's more difficult to get uh, more customers. The interest rate are interest rates are hiking, which uh, means more expensive uh, loans and uh, more expensive uh, debts. Maybe you will be unable to uh, pay your debt because of the increased uh, uh, monthly payment or, or perform certain contracts. In this period. Uh, there are some uh, the Bain and uh, company recommends organizing uh, uh, or reorganizing your uh, companies around six urgent priorities, which I which I th think important for you to navigate through difficult times, and uh, probably not accidental that on the uh, uh, first place is to protect your employees and customers because uh, your employee your business is uh, your business depends on your employees and, uh, and and your income depends on your customers so basically your success depends on your uh, employees and customers and uh, you have to create your uh, uh, recession period financial modeling around these two uh, two factors you have to defend your revenue. Probably, uh, uh, your revenue is not going to increase in uh, in, a, in a downturn uh, economy. It's more difficult to get uh, customers, so uh, you have to you have to defend what you have, and uh, and it is a good time to uh, reorganize your uh, your operations, make a, make a, uh, make your operations a little bit more effective. And when we are getting out of these uh, uh, difficult times, you are going to have more solid foundation and uh, to uh, build your build your uh, growth up on it. <clears throat> if um, maybe maybe it's, it's always a good idea, but uh, in, in a downturn economy, probably it's. Uh, more important to find alternative financing resources, um, which uh, are uh, non-equity uh, financing resources. You can find more and more in, in the US too, in, in Europe. Uh, the, uh, the grant programs are uh, uh, more important, but uh, we can see at federal level and state level, a lot more uh, programs, uh, financial support available for uh, for start uh, for startups for small companies. During the COVID, there was a PPP program for companies. Some parts of the program uh, was extended through this year, still available at federal level. The Small Business Administration has uh, loan programs. You can check uh, federal agencies, the NASA, the uh, Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and many other federal agencies has their own grant programs. So especially if, if uh, you are an R&D heavy uh, startup, these uh, agencies uh, have uh, interesting 
um, grant programs, you can get a couple of hundred thousand dollars to to uh, close to a million or even a million dollars in, uh, in uh, separate phases. It's not easy to apply though and uh, comply with these programs. Many of you are uh, foreign uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and most of the time these agencies require uh, US citizen founders, which uh, makes it virtually unavailable for, uh, for foreign companies. But for uh, US startups, US uh, companies, it, sometimes they are very, uh, very good programs. For foreign entrepreneurs, I have to say that uh, the Regional Business Development Council have uh, good programs. They have a budget to entice companies to their region. Uh, here in the US, uh, I know the, uh, the Sacramento area has an aggressive uh, regional business development council who are uh, offering uh, financial aid if you relocate to that area. Central in uh, Central Valley of uh, California has a similar uh, business uh, development council, but in other states and other other region uh, have uh, have similar programs. You uh, you can find them on the internet, reach them, reach them out, and and talk to them. Uh, maybe they, uh, if they like your uh, like your, you like your startup, they can give you some incentives if you decide to uh, um, move to their region. Um, so when you get in trouble, then. Uh, uh, you need to you need to deal with it, and in the uh, following a few slides, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how you can uh, deal with your problems. If, if you have a, if you have a high, if you have debts, then uh, you can uh, uh, convert it into equity. You are going to give up a portion of your uh, company, but uh, you are going to have uh, more, uh, more cash and, uh, and you can pay for employees. Like I, like I said, uh, if you have to decide between your key employees or, uh, or, your equity, or, or your equity, then probably your key employees is more important. Conversion, uh, conversion is uh, sometimes is a, is a good idea. I tend to be stingy with my equity. Uh, as many founders are, but uh, there are situations when you need to realize that half of something is uh, is better than, uh, or uh, some percentage of something, as a matter of fact, is better than 100% of nothing. Um, cancellation of debt. Sometimes you can uh, you can cut a deal with your uh, with your creditors, and they, they release you from uh, from a debt obligation. The most important uh, uh, issue with the, the uh, cancellation of indebtedness in the US is, uh, is that if the IRS considers this as an income and you have to pay tax. So if, uh, if the property, for example, secured, then, uh, then it is treated as uh, a sold property uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the creditor takes uh, possession of the property and uh, based on if you have a recourse or non-recourse, and recourse, uh, uh, that means that you are personally liable and non-recourse and you are not personally liable, um, you have to uh, uh, pay uh, tax and, uh, and, you have, and, and when you are consider the debt forgiveness, you have to consider the tax consequences. The, sometimes you have a personal, you have to give personal guarantees, or uh, or you have to, uh, you are going to be personally liable to to your debts. We we have uh, the springing recourse guarantee um, a structure, which means that uh, um, the personal guarantee becomes effective upon the occurrence of certain conditions, like when you go bankruptcy. The uh, bad boy guarantee, uh, guarantees are very similar. They, they are uh, uh, term 
into debt, into uh, personally, it makes you personally liable at, uh, in a certain uh, cert circumstances. So basically they convert the otherwise non-recourse loan into a, for, uh, into a full recourse uh, loan. Um, usually fraud, misapplication of funds, unauthorized transfer of mortgage, real property, uh, bankruptcy filing trigger uh, bad boys, bad boy guarantees. In California, I, I would like to just uh, mention the uh, California Code section 2815, that in certain circumstances, the California law actually allow guarantors uh, to revoke uh, for, for, to the, uh, in connection to uh, future transactions. So you can, you can revoke your guarantee based on California law. Some uh, uh, contract, uh, uh, contract clauses and uh, contract principles uh, can help you to uh, avoid performance in certain circumstances. One of them is the force measure that uh, while uh, probably one of the most well-known uh, contract clause that allows you to uh, terminate the agreement in certain circumstances. Um, it was uh, very interesting during the uh, COVID and the lockdown period. Some uh, parties of the agreement uh, tried to, uh, try to terminate the contract based on force measure and uh, they didn't succeed. Right now, uh, most almost all uh, Force measure clauses include pandemic, ep epidemic uh, carve outs that ensure that the force measure clause will not apply situation like uh, COVID. We have some uh, contractual excuses when you when you can excuse your performance. When there is an enforceable contract, the parties have a duty to perform. Uh, the, sales, uh, the seller must deliver the goods, the, the buyer must uh, pay for it. In other words, you, the duty to perform must be uh, discharged. It can be discharged by performance, but in circumstances, circumstances, you can excuse the duty to perform. And uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, legal principles, the impracticability, the impossibility, uh, and, uh, and the frustration of purpose. The impracticability is an extreme un, uh, un, unreasonable uh, difficulty which was uh, unexpected by the parties. So for example, if a company uh, contracts to buy 1 million uh, gallon of oil uh, in the Persian Gulf and subs subsequently a, a war breaks out in the Gulf, then this uh, clause may apply and uh, you can avoid the contract. However, the, that was an interesting case when the court explained that if subsequently, and it was actually uh, in the relation during the uh, Gulf War um, period, and the court explained that if uh, if uh, there is a war in, for example, Egypt, and uh, the Suez Canal is blocked, forcing the ship to uh, use an alternative route. This impracticability clause wouldn't apply because merely because of the increase in uh, cost of shipping or uh, price increase, uh, you cannot uh, avoid your contract. It's uh, when you are taking a when you are uh, doing business, you, you are taking the risk of uh, of an increase in uh, cost increase in, in price. So even fifty percent increase in cost have been held insufficient by the U.S. court. The frustration of purpose. Is again another unfor unforeseen event um, that renders the, the 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 purpose of the contract valueless. And uh, if you, for example, if you want to hold an event and rent out a place in a city, then the hurricane hits and the city becomes a disaster area. No one, no one can attend the event. You may terminate. Uh, the agreement. The um, um, school study examples are the coronation cases. This couple here is uh, 
um, King Edward VII and uh, Queen Alexandra. Uh, they uh, uh, plan to plan to hold their coronation coronation ceremony in July 26, uh, 1902. But uh, unfortunately, a few days before the uh, ceremony, the uh, the king had a terrible stomachache, and they postponed the coronation ceremony uh, to uh, August 9th. Many people who came to uh, attend the ceremony they rented out. Uh, apartments in, in London, some, in some, uh, some case, uh, some person uh, rented out, rented out um, an apartment for 75, 75 pounds in 1902 uh, for two days. And in the other case, uh, 140 pounds for the same two days, which is around uh, 10, 16,000 pounds and now uh, two days value. And of course, when the coronation ceremony was postponed, they didn't want to pay for the rent. And, and the court held that the only purpose they wanted to uh, uh, wanted this contract is to uh, watch the coronation ceremony. And uh, because of the, uh, because uh, they postponed this uh, even the, uh, the purpose of the contract was frustrated and they could actually avoid uh, the rent payment. The management has a, um, a, a responsibility to uh, uh, manage the company uh, in the company's and shareholders' best interest. They have fiduciary duty that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more in the next few slides. And uh, and uh, for these uh, difficult times when uh, you can expect uh, interruption in, in your business, you can get uh, coverage. This coverage uh, can uh, replace the incomes lost um, for the event or uh, for contracts then, uh, that were uh, not performed. And uh, that helps you to uh, uh, pay your uh, reoccurring operation, uh, operational cost. You can cover uh, lost. Uh, you can cover employees, uh, expenses, relocation, and, and so on. But uh, again, it's very similar to the uh, uh, ever-evolving uh, force measure clause. The uh, business in, uh, interruption in insurance agreements are also uh, developing, and we can see more and more uh, uh, carve-outs. And uh, again, we had a couple of cases. During COVID, when we uh, when we when we saw that even even if businesses paid uh, for their insurance, the, the insurance company refused uh, to provide coverage for COVID because of uh, of the carve out that already had in place in their agreement. The DNO insurance uh, protects uh, the uh, directors and officers. Um, the directors and officers in some, even if uh, the, uh, the, the company has a separate, a separate uh, entity and uh, limits liability, in certain circumstances, um, the uh, directors and officers have uh, a personal liability. One of, uh, one of these examples is the alter ego case when uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, the, uh, the directors have fiduciary duty and, uh, and uh, the alter ego is a legal doctrine whereby the court uh, finds that the corporation lacks a separate identity from an individual or the, or, or the corporate shareholder. And, uh, and, and it holds that the, uh, the people, the shareholders or the company managers are basically the alter ego or the co company is the alter ego of these, uh, of these individuals. Um, to avoid this alter ego problem, it's very important to uh, not to commingle your personal funds uh, with the company's funds, keep sufficiently uh, accurate records and uh, keep the corporate formalities that uh, they actually can prove that the company is a, is a separate entity. You have to uh, have the board meetings regularly, uh, shareholder meetings, have the resolution in place and, uh, and, uh, and keep the records. 
because uh, that helps you, helps the management to uh, uh, protect themselves from personal uh, liability. The, the managers, directors, and officers have uh, fiduciary uh, duties and uh, the duty of loyalty, duty of care, duty of a good face, and in the, uh, always acting in good face um, are the most important, uh, important duties. The business judgment rule is a, a protection for a, uh, the business judgment rule. I'm going to talk about in a Q and A about the piercing the corporate veil. Um, uh, the business judgment rule is a, basically a, a, an interesting rule that protects the uh, the directors and officers. It's a, it's a reasonable as standards, as long as the uh, officers are acting uh, reasonably, as a reasonable person would act under the circumstances, they can, uh, they can uh, avoid uh, liability. And uh, now I, I passed one hour and uh, I would start the next, uh, next section, which would be some uh, venture capital terms. So, but uh, I would like to uh, stop here and not get into this uh, topic. And uh, if you have uh, uh, really uh, questions about uh, about venture capital terms, investor protection, then during the Q and A we can uh, we can discuss it. But I would like to stop here and open up uh, the uh, this uh, presentation to the Q and A's uh, and and answer some questions if you have. So the first question, uh, um, I, I see a lot of questions in the in the chat box, but what I, I try to answer, but uh, it, it's better if you put your questions in the uh, in the Q and A box because um, it's easier to follow. What are the implications of a technical recession? Two consecutive negative uh, GDP quarters versus uh, the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research uh, declaring a recession. So the technical recession, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, is two uh, negative, negative GDP, uh, GDP quarters. And, uh, and I, I, would, I would say that uh, um, because each, each, uh, each, uh, each recession is different, it's uh, not necessarily a good indicator that uh, the, we have two, um, uh, negative quarters and, or, or only one negative quarters or or we have sometimes uh, a negative quarter followed by a positive quarter and and uh, again a, again a negative quarter we, i think uh, i think it's more important that how how this uh, turn down uh, effect of uh, eff uh, affects the economy and and this is the death lengths and uh, <clears throat> and uh, and and the and the causes of uh, of the uh, re recession period. So if uh, if we have a good uh, uh, foundations, if don't have any um, any problem in the uh, any structural problem in, in the economy, then uh, then we can expect a, a shallow or uh, a recession. That the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, basically. Uh, uh, basically reports recession based on the uh, economic indicators and uh, and they don't have uh, they don't have this strict um, uh, a strict rule that it has to be uh, two consecutive uh, uh, consecutive uh, GDP quarters so um, so if, if you are looking at the uh, at the economic research uh, research data, you can uh, you can get a get a general idea about the uh, economic uh, performances, but uh, but it's, it's even if the economic performance is uh, is weaker in the in the given given period, officially it's it's, uh, it's still not uh, not a recession, but in in reality, 
I think what is most uh, what is more important is that um, if we are if we are looking at the uh, NBER's uh, um, data, then you can you can actually get uh, a more subtle idea about the economic performance, and you can uh, you can get a better idea of the of the uh, of the effects on the uh, on the ground or on the economy. <clears throat> What is considered food, food safety business? Um, everything that uh, that solves the uh, uh, the food problem that could be an agricultural company, agricultural startup, startups that uh, have a revolutionary uh, idea from uh, production, agricultural production, or uh, or it could be a tech company too that solves. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the food problems may uh, allow us to to have uh, more uh, more food available for us. In slide number eight, it said the oil price is negative. I am I'm not <laughs> I'm not catch it well. Please explain. Well, it's uh, it's it's true that happened. Uh, that was the uh, uh, the futures trading. May 2000 and 2020 actually yeah. on that day I was I was trading natural gas and uh, and I just uh, it was uh, close to the uh, uh, end of uh, uh, the, when the future on the day when the future expired uh, at, uh, in me almost uh, almost immediately I just uh, switched my screen. And when I switched it back, I, I didn't believe didn't believe in my eyes. The uh, actually the uh, the oil oil future showed thirty uh, negative uh, negative thirty thirty two uh, dollars, and that's and that's where they uh, they closed the uh, contracts uh, at that day. It it actually really made, really meant that the person who wanted to uh, get out of the uh, the futures contract had to pay for it. Nobody, nobody wanted to, uh, nobody wanted to buy. Uh, virtually, there were no buyer on the market on that day. Do you think the more money uh, giving for loans will be a, a negative impact on those businesses that were already struggling due to the uh, COVID vaccination strict policies? Some uh, couldn't thrive due to uh, many people not wanting the, uh, the vaccination and was forced to use funding just to pay bills. Now that the rules have been lowered, but many uh, startups or pre-existing uh, businesses are still suffering due to uh, lack of businesses. Do you have uh, any suggestions? Let me try to understand this question. Um, so if, if I understand well, if, uh, if, if, the, if the government would give uh, extended uh, loans to the startups would uh, help or it would have uh, negative effects to those businesses. I think it depends on, uh, on the companies and uh, what uh, financing you are taking, you always need to uh, consider your, uh, your businesses your uh, your needs and you need to plan accordingly even if if it is a loan or if it is a, if, if it is an equity round um if you if you uh, if you need need money the, to to run your businesses probably it could help but uh, you have to plan carefully because uh, if it is a loan you have to pay it back at some at some point and you have to pay uh, interest and uh, you can get in a uh, in a in a bad situation if if you take out too loans uh, too much loan and then uh, you won't be able to uh, pay your debt back. Uh, so um, so the loan requires uh, some uh, uh, some uh, regular cash cash flow that uh, ensures that you are able to pay your. Uh, your monthly uh, interest payment, 
if uh, if you are unable to uh, unable to pay, maybe uh, maybe it's better to uh, get some uh, equity financing or uh, or convertible debt, which uh, can be converted into equity if you uh, if you are unable to uh, pay your debt or the company is uh, uh, getting deeper into uh, the, the crisis. But I, I would I would say the loan uh, and also the uh, uh, the financing is always a business decision and it depends on what you what the company needs and uh, and probably the uh, available more loans with uh, uh, discounted or lower interest rate could help the companies but uh, but I, I think the uh, the governments and the administration also needs to be careful not to uh, uh, not to lend uh, irresponsibly because uh, it actually uh, uh, may in that the companies that can ruin them actually what are some top skills needed for and entering uh, venture capital during a recession. Advice on what to highlight in efforts to be competitive with uh, bear hiring. That's a, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, uh, top skills needed for entering the VC uh, during a recession. I, I think uh, the question is about uh, raising new funds, new, uh, creating a new venture capital fund. If it is, uh, if it is, if, if it is about fund formation, um, always I, I would say the top skills to know uh, to know the uh, to know the industry. Uh, to know uh, which uh, sector would you would like to you would like to enter, and uh, you must be able to raise money because uh, what I what I just said in a in a, a, a recession period it's uh, more difficult to uh, raise a new fund. So uh, probably if you if you are a first time uh, first time manager. It is uh, very difficult to uh, convince investors to uh, give you money. So I would say uh, in the management, you must have some uh, experienced, uh, experienced people who have been there, who have, been there, who, who have done, uh, done this business and, uh, and it, it can give you more, uh, more respect and reputation. So I, I would say uh, in, in better hiring, probably the most important skill is uh, is experience, because um, <clears throat> uh, experience experienced professionals are always in demand, and uh, and uh, and they are the ones who can uh, help you through in any difficult period. Let's see what what else we have. So is there an obligation to pay back angel or venture capital seed investors? Taking loads are significantly risk, riskier, riskier, correct? Um, the angel and venture capital seed investors are uh, receiving, uh, usually they get a portion of your company. So um, in some case, you can, uh, you can uh, give them redeemable shares, but uh, as a general, uh, principle, you are not paying back uh, venture capital uh, uh, investment. Um, nowadays, we are uh, we are doing it at seed level and uh, and angel level. We are using uh, uh, safe agreements, convertible notes. If you if we are talking about convertible notes financing, that basically a debt uh, security, what you can pay back or convert into equity. But if you are converting into equity, then you all have to pay back. Taking, uh, taking loans, are, uh, loans are significantly riskier. I would say uh, not necessarily. There are uh, advantages and disadvantages of, of both. If you are taking out loan, 
then uh, you are not giving out equity. You don't, uh, you don't uh, give your companies, uh, com companies away or, uh, or any portion of your companies away. And, um, and, uh, and uh, if you have a, a later round, you, you still have dry, dry powder to give it to investors. But uh, on the other hand, you have, you have an obligation to pay it back. Uh, you pay uh, you pay sometimes uh, a significant uh, interest on the um, uh, on the loan. Uh, I think you should consider the loan if you have uh, a regular income. Startups usually don't have a uh, regular income, and uh, if you if you are run out of cash, then you can get into trouble with with the loan. So. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's not a, not a black and white uh, issue, which one is better. I think uh, it's, a, it's a business decision and uh, you have to look at the advantages on, and disadvantages based on your uh, situation. Are the alternative sources of financing debt options affected by, uh, by the federal fund rate? Um, so alternative financing sources, I meant uh, uh, basically uh, a grant and, uh, and subs subsidized uh, loan. So the, the, uh, the Small Business Association has a, a loan and uh, they are subsidized. In, in some way, I actually, I didn't even check the, uh, the current interest rate. I, it, it is possible that, uh, that they increased, but uh, but it's still lower than uh, than the market rate. That's that's the whole point of the of these uh, these federal funds that um, that they uh, they remain lower than the uh, than the market market rates. They are not fixed though, so um, uh, it it changes with the market. So um, I, I don't know if they have raised it, but, uh, uh, but it, it is likely that they are going to raise, uh, raise the, uh, these, uh, these funds, uh, the interest rate at some point, if they haven't done so. What of people from uh, African countries like Kenya? How can get? How can we get uh, support for, for startup? Some of us have uh, project proposals that can uh, change even the uh, world, but uh, we can get. Uh, we can. We can't apply funds. Most people uh, steal our ideas and use your personal benefit. Um, I think there are separate issues. That's a very, very good question here. First, uh, how can how can a, uh, an African company uh, get funds? Um, recently, we have uh, we have had uh, several um, startups from uh, from Africa, and uh, and if you have a, a good project, a good, good startup, American and European funders, uh, uh, funds, VC funds uh, are happy to invest in. Uh, in African company, you have to uh, you just have to reach them out. You you find uh, find them. I I would I believe that uh, now uh, the uh, this uh, ESG uh, issues, the uh, social impact and impact investing is very popular, and uh, and because of that. Uh, companies uh, from uh, from uh, Africa and uh, and just maybe maybe from Asia can get uh, can get money from uh, from certain impact impact fund. Actually, there are here in California. Uh, well, I think they are, or maybe they are in Oregon. But you have to look them up. There is a social impact fund that actually they are running. Uh, funds for African startups or uh, or startups in uh, remote remote areas, disadvantaged uh, areas, uh, poorer countries. There are specific there are funds specifically specialized on on that. Uh, how you can as you, people steal your ideas? It's a it's it's a general problem. You really need to uh, 
talk to uh, legal professionals, and you have you need a professional help to protect your ideas and uh, with with contracts and also uh, with uh, company policies and uh, and know what you can uh, what you can disclose. So when uh, when you uh, get in front of an investor or uh, or uh, or another business uh, professional. And uh, and have to be have to be prepared. I think this is one of the areas that worth the investment because uh, because uh, your ideas uh, is going to give you the success. The ideas is is your business, and uh, it's very it's it's imperative to protect it. <clears throat> Can you send? Yes, uh, we are going to send a, a, a webinar. Uh, I think a link to the uh, video, and uh, we can. Uh, I think usually we send send out the slides too, and um, and other uh, materials as well. Any advice on uh, doing a safe post money raise? Um, yes. Don't do it. Don't do uh, <laughs> our uh, the safe is very popular, so it's, it's not not the safe we uh, we we like safe, and uh, and most of our our deals right now is uh, is a safe deal, but uh, at our firm and uh, and I I think it's uh, among lawyers still uh, the pre money safe is uh, is more. Uh, more popular than uh, than post money safe, and uh, the reason the reason is that if you are using post money safe, then uh, then the investor is not going to uh, dilute. You have to uh, you have to uh, absorb all the dilution in the uh, uh, in the triggering round, and. Uh, the way I'm I'm looking at the post money safe is uh, is very similar to the uh, uh, absolute anti delusion protection in uh, in the shareholder uh, protection rights. What we are not using anymore. Now we are using a weighted average uh, uh, average uh, model, usually formula, where the uh, investor takes some delusion uh, and. Uh, and of course, the founders also absorb some of the delusion. But in post safe, um, the uh, the company, the, the founders, uh, are going to dilute, and the safe investor is not going to dilute. Uh, y Combinator uh, uh, advertises the post safe is uh, more predictable because uh, you know how how much uh, percentage you are going to uh, give up. And it's uh, more predictable for the investors. So it's obviously it's very good for the investors, but uh, the pre-money safe is more uh, founders friendly, and uh, very, very it is possible we are using uh, pre-money safe. And I I recommend everybody to keep using pre-money safe if, if it is possible. Most of the time, it's uh, the post-money safe is everywhere, and it's not a um, not necessarily the uh, the terms uh, determine the uh, determine which one you are going to use. This is just uh, uh, seems more available uh, in the industry. But if you are uh, if you are aware of uh, of the uh, of the dif of the difference between pre money and post money safe, and you approach the investor that. From the beginning, that you would like to uh, use a pre-money safe, then uh, then most likely you can uh, you can uh, you can get this. You can uh, convince the investor to uh, uh, to stay with the post-money safe, and I, I think it would uh, it would be much better for you. Uh, the conversion when when it comes to conversion, uh, the uh, the conversion calculation is. Uh, uh, very complicated and uh, not always obvious how to uh, uh, how to uh, calculate and uh, what numbers you can use. There are some uh, arbitrary numbers in the formula that you have to uh, apply 
which is uh, which is not good. Um, the pre money is uh, is still uh, clear uh, clear formula conversion formula and uh, and still you can actually predict what uh, what the investors are going to get, especially if you have a valuation cap, then uh, you can uh, you can make a model uh, calculation. So I I recommend pre money save to everybody. What about an assessment for uh, near worst case? For example, recession or depression going for the next uh, two or three years. My assessment is that the current situation is more based on a high cost of energy influenced by a current uh, US energy policy and the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, yeah, if, we, if you remember the, uh, the chart, what I showed you, um the recession period uh, usually takes 8 11 months when we have a structural problem it, it, it took longer so i don't think this uh, recession or depression period is going to last uh, two or three years um true that uh, even even if it, in each period the, the recession period was uh, less than a year it, it was followed by a slower recovery. So if you look at the dot-com uh, crisis, we had one, we had about, I think the dot-com crisis actually uh, was an eight, eight month or eight or 11 month uh, recession period, but the, uh, the post-recession recovery took years. But uh, but this post uh, but this long post recession recovery period took years because uh, because of the, uh, the huge dislocation in the uh, in the technology market, many companies went bankrupt. A huge amount of money was uh, burned uh, with the with the bankruptcy, and uh, and and it took time to rebuild that value that was lost. Here. I, here we don't really have this uh, this kind of structural problem in the economy. The, the companies are not going bankrupt, and uh, and we don't see the uh, the uh, the financial sector uh, financial sectors troubles either. What we had in two thousand and eight, what we had in the eighties. So um, even if it, it is my opinion, and I, I don't expect two or three years of uh, of uh, recovery or 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 bad period this time. And uh, and the cost of energy, yes, the cost of a uh, high cost of energy is definitely uh, one one factor, but. Uh, but uh, like I said, there is uh, other factors and it, which uh, which uh, add to this uh, whole complex uh, thing, the uh, supply chain uh, problems, the, uh, uh, the, the food price, the um, uh, backlog of, uh, of uh, consumer demands, is all uh, add to this, uh, this uh, whole economic uh, issue. And, uh, is, and, and the Russian-Ukraine war is on only one factor. So even if the Russian Russia Ukraine war takes two or three years, I, I don't think that is going to determine uh, the next few years uh, economic performance. Yes, we are going to share the slides. Thank you for uh, answer to my question. To get grants, it is possible to get grants and loan to pay off uh, other other loans that that will allow you to invest more uh, in your businesses. Usually, uh, the grant the grant programs are um, uh, for a certain purpose to a certain certain projects and uh, and the way you uh, you use uh, you use these grants uh, are predetermined. You have to use it for the project, and uh, many times you won't be able to uh, use the grant money for uh, salaries, for example. They are they are giving you giving the uh, grants uh, to uh, develop a, a, a prototype or uh, or uh, or uh, or 
develop your uh, develop your product further. Um, Maybe the uh, like I said, the uh, the regional business development councils have a budget to uh, to help you. They uh, have uh, more flexible programs, and they 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 can actually give you money that you can uh, use freely. And uh, if, if if that's what you need, you can actually use for uh, uh, for paying out your uh, your debts too. But um, you need to reach them out. Actually, I, I think uh, the uh, regional business development councils are very helpful, and uh, they have uh, a lot of useful tools to help startups. Um, I have some more questions. I, I already run out of the one and a half hours, but uh, I would like to. <clears throat> Answer these uh, questions. See what four questions left. It's a good. Actually, it's a good question. What is a good good amount to invest in a startup uh, to be in good standing legally and ensure there is a there is a good turnaround? So when you are when you invest, uh, when you are uh, raising funds, you have to uh, have to consider. Uh, couple of different things. You have to consider uh, your, uh, uh, your business plan, how much money you need, and, uh, and, uh, and, and how far the money takes you. Usually the investors uh, would like to see your business plan and the investors uh, want, to, uh, want to give you just enough money to, uh, to reach your next milestone and then uh, then in the next round they give you some more money to to reach reach a mono, uh, reach another milestone that's how the uh, the the different or, or the, uh, the different series is are uh, follow one another so um, <clears throat> and uh, and I think this is a, this is a good idea that uh, you you need uh, you need a business plan in place and you, you must have a couple of milestones, how you are going to reach uh, um, your goal and, uh, and what would be the, what would be the each, each separate step. That's, that's the business side of, uh, of, the, uh, of the fundraising. And there is a legal side because uh, whenever you are raising funds, you have to, uh, have to comply with the securities laws, and uh, and startups um, routinely uh, rely on exceptions because uh, you know, securities laws require you to uh, Section Five of the Security Act uh, requires you if you are sale if you sell a security you have to register unless some uh, exception applies, and um, there is one popular exception for uh, startups if uh, if you are an issuer selling your shares and uh, and this uh, this share is uh, is not a public offering then you don't have to register your shares but uh, what is uh, what is not a public offering interesting questions and uh, and then uh, and then eventually the SEC in the 80s to avoid litig litigation about uh, litigation over the uh, issue of public offering, created the regulation D, and uh, what is uh, is a well, well known safe harbor. If if you uh, comply with these rules, then uh, you can ensure that you uh, you meet the exception. But uh, but the problem with the Problem with fundraising is that uh, they are complying with the exception. You might break up your uh, your uh, investments, uh, smaller smaller batches of uh, of funds, and and start a series of uh, investment, which, uh, if you consider you know, aggregate, wouldn't qualify for the exception. So that's uh, that leads us to an integration rule, which is very complicated. But uh, but the idea is that for securities purposes, you need to plan your financing needs at least for a year, year period. And, uh, and when you run um, a, a fundraising, then, uh, then you must have sufficient money 
to uh, to operate for a while without without the need of a, of a for all financing. As a rule of thumb, I would I would say that you have to keep a six month uh, six month between each uh, each fundraising. So you you must have uh, must have enough funds from the from the investors to uh, operate for six months. So that's uh, if if you could if you could reach the milestones shorter, you still need to consider that uh, you have to you have to allow more time between uh, between each fundraising for securities law purposes. What are some pros and cons of starting company now in software, SaaS, and uh, and metaverse? Well, I I wouldn't say that uh, wouldn't say that uh, we have pros and cons. Pros and cons. If you have a good idea, it's uh, it's. I think software, SaaS, and and metaverse are uh, very good industries. Um, maybe the pros are the increasing. Uh, Increasing competition on this uh, in in this sector, and uh, and there is an increase in competition. Then, of course, it's it's more difficult to to raise funds. Sometimes, uh, sometimes VC funds turn you down just because they already have uh, five or six uh, uh, similar projects in their in their portfolio. What we have seen, actually, if, if you are if you are talking better first, it reminds me of Facebook. Facebook, uh, when uh, when uh, Zuckerberg uh, were raising funds for Facebook, he was turned down by the uh, the, the best uh, Silicon Valley uh, fund managers only because they already had uh, a couple of other uh, social media platform projects in their portfolio that all eventually, as we know, went belly up and Facebook survived. So. Um, <clears throat> So the competition could be uh, could be one uh, one call one disadvantage, but uh, but software and SaaS and metaverse are I I, I think they are uh, it's a very good industry and uh, I I uh, I like it and if I if I were a fund manager probably I would keep them in my portfolio. How much approximate fees to start and maintain uh, a for-profit and a non-profit uh, company per year for legal? Uh, that's uh, uh, that's um, uh, that's an interesting question. It's uh, it it is depends on uh, on the area where you are. And uh, and your legal need, legal needs. I I think uh, this is one question that you should uh, you should discuss with uh, with a, with an attorney in your specific case. In general, I would say that uh, the, uh, to setting up a nonprofit in the U.S. is uh, considerably more expensive than uh, than a for-profit company because of the uh, application for the nonprofit status is. Uh, Kind of complicated and it requires a lot of paperwork. The maintenance, uh, the maintenance of a nonprofit uh, requires more uh, reporting. You have in California, you have to uh, file the tax return with the uh, California Attorney General's office. You need uh, you need filing for Secretary of State. You need uh, you need a tax return, and uh, you need more uh, more detailed and uh, accurate uh, reporting for tax purposes. So it's uh, it's obviously more expensive uh, to run, maintain, to fund, maintain than a, than a for-profit company. A for-profit company, a maintenance cost, of course, it depends on on the company's business activity. Um, when you don't have uh, business activity, you have to pay uh, um, a state franchise tax, even if uh, you don't have to be a thing like Delaware says that you all have to pay tax in Delaware, but you still have to file an annual report and pay franchise tax. And uh, and uh, and you still need some uh, accounting uh, for uh, filing the tax returns. So you have, uh, have certain fees. It's not much, I would say that, um, 
just um, just maybe above a thousand dollars and you can maintain uh, a company, including uh, fees and taxes. Okay, uh, I run out of questions in the Q and A, and already run out of time. Um, so uh, I'm closing this uh, presentation. Thank you uh, very much uh, for your attention, and uh, and uh, I hope you uh, I hope you uh, like this presentation. You learn something from it, and. And if you have a question, please uh, feel free to uh, reach me out either uh, via email or on, on LinkedIn. I'm uh, happy to uh, continue this discussion with any one of you. Thank you very much. Bye.